This is the State of Things, and we're live from the Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh. I'm Frank Stacio, and uh, the band you heard just as we ended our last segment was the Mint Julep Jazz Band. They're here, and we're going to talk with them a little bit later on. You'll hear their music, and of course, they're playing a fundraiser tomorrow night in Durham. We'll talk all about that. We're live streaming this, so if you go to our website, stateofthings.org, you can see the museum's live stream of this program. And what we're going to be talking about is science, which is, of course, a discipline grounded in facts. Scientists are trained to carefully analyze and assess information in objective ways. The world of politics is not nearly as objective. Opinions vary widely, and assessments of the facts are not entirely objective. But the policies developed in the political realm influence scientific research, and, of course, science influences politics. So what happens when science and politics collide? How do public policies shape scientific developments, and how do scientists respond? Joining us now is a panel of people to discover and consider the intersection of science and public policy. Emlyn Coster is the director of the Museum of Natural Sciences here in Raleigh, North Carolina's Natural Sciences Museum. Emlyn, welcome back. Good to have you back. Thank you very much, Frank. And thank you for uh, uh, allowing us to be in this space. It's wonderful. Terry Lomax, Vice Chancellor of the Office of Research, Innovation, and Economic Development at NC State. Terry Lomax, welcome. Good to Great to be here, Frank. And welcoming back Scott Hewler, a Raleigh-based writer who blogs for Scientific American. Always good to see you, Scott. Glad to be here, Frank. Emily Coster, let's talk about this because the museum has made other headlines. There is the discovery of a dinosaur and also the headlines this week, the departure of Meg Lohman, director of the Nature Research Center. Her move comes after the governor redesignated some museum positions as non-exempt, and that means they're going to serve at the will of the governor. And so some critics... Uh, some critics of the move to non-exempt positions say it makes employees vulnerable to the, to the shifting political tides uh, and require them to sort of answer to the governor. Um, uh, talk about that. About the, I think nine positions here in the museum were shifted from what would have been considered more or less civil service kind of positions to at will, meaning if the governor doesn't like what you're doing, you're gone. Uh, six positions, uh, Frank, were added in early August to the one that I already held that was exempt. But I would like to pull apart some of the things you connected respectfully in your question. And we knew t I, I will quickly just take you back three years ago when this incredible institution was uh, underway with planning for the Nature Research Center, which would ask and answer the question, how do we know what we know, which had been the focus of the 2000 building. Part of the um, uh, innovation in that planning was that we would uh, enter into a new era, a new style of relationships with uh, universities. And six joint appointments would be created, four with NC State, one with NC Central, and one with Appalachian State University. And this was uh, a very um, uh, innovative thing to do because mostly museums had had adjunct positions, not uh, joint appointed positions of the type that you've just had a marvelous example of with Dr. Lindsay Zano, who is a research professor in mm -hmm. biological sciences and also a, uh, a lead in our lab upstairs. So Meg uh, was one of those uh, six, and um, the, the unit that was called the Nature Research Center um, when I came here as the new director earlier this year, and as widely discussed with uh, the boards and the, and the government, uh, it was felt that the, there was going to be a need to try to amalgamate, unify what had been the separate unit left over from the capital campaign, the NRC, the Nature Research Center, into alignment with the whole. And so I took that move back in May and June. And uh, then I discussed with uh, Meg Lauman, as has been documented elsewhere in the, in the news coverage, that um, her role would be best parlayed into being not an NRC-specific role, but into a museum-wide role in which she would become senior scientist and director of academic partnerships and global initiatives. And so that's the position from which she's recently decided, and we're very excited for her, to become the chief of science and sustainability at the California Academy of Sciences. So there's an administrative decision to make that kind of a change. It changes her position. She decides to move on to a different job. That's one thing. Th then there's this larger question that may or may not be related to that particular administrative decision. Um, then that is the question of whether what happens when scientists are beholden to, essentially, political office holders. Well, 
that there is no connection, just to be clear, Frank. And so, um, for example, Betsy Bennett, my predecessor of 22 years, went in and out of exemption several times. And the level of exempt positions in the public service has also risen and fallen over the years. It's, uh, it tends to change uh, with administrations. Um, I've been in exempt-type positions, and many of the other museums at the state level across the United States are also uh, have a mixed bag of classifications of their managerial positions. The fact is that the mission of the museum prevails, that good science is good science, and in no way has the thinking or the action of this museum been in any way modified by, by us being included to the tune of six positions um, in, in this recent uh, move by the government. Well, there was other news this week about the museum. Scott Hewler, you recently wrote a blog post about a film that the museum elected not to screen. Tell us about that. Well, the... Um uh, the people in New York were making a film called, what's the title of the film? You have it there, I should think. Short Up. Short Up. The, about the, the effects of rising sea levels on uh, development, coastal development. And, you know, hun uh, more than 100 million Americans live near the coast. And they were using, it as they began developing the film, North Carolina as their sort of, as the, the gallant to the goofus of, New Jersey where they harden the shore and they put in the groins and they do all that kind of stuff and granted we do plenty of crazy things here we you know we replenish the sand and we uh, we rebuild roads where nature plainly doesn't want there to be roads but overall the Outer Banks are the wonderful playground that they are because they're natural because they have been allowed to remain natural and they move when nature says they need to move while they were creating the film, while they were working on Short Up, we had the whole sea level controversy of last year, uh, sea level rise, where the legislature was taking all kinds of absolutely insane measures to prevent people from planning for and measuring sea level rise. And that and, became a and big just issue. just to tell you objectively what they actually did was to say that you may not take sea level rise into account when making development decisions. That was the actual fact of what they did, but go ahead. Right. Um, and so North Carolina, they began looking at North Carolina in a very different way and very much more closely. And I haven't seen the documentary, of course. It hasn't come here yet. And then what happened this week was the museum decided not to show the documentary here, and um, I wrote in Scientific American that I didn't understand that decision. Well, that maybe you can explain that for us. Uh, the, the, the filmmakers came to you and they said, would you show it at the museum? And there's a protocol, a process that it goes through, and you made the decision. So, so maybe walk us through the process briefly. Um, what happens when somebody comes to you and says, will you show my film at your museum? We have a cross-functional program committee, which meets um, almost weekly to review the latest next batch of decisions about what will be the speakers and the subjects across time in such places as the Daily Planet. Um, the cafe on Thursday evening, which last night dealt with climate change and forest fires, for example. Um, and so this committee had an unusual request because it's not often that we get proposition to show a 60-minute film by an organization with which we worked with before, I should say, um, to, to have that as the as, as a way of dealing with clearly a very complex science-based but also intertwined with society and environment issues. And so um, the committee was of the view that this wasn't an, the best way in which to deal with an issue with which the museum already deals, by the way. We have extensive coverage here in our exhibits and programs on matters of climate change and sea level and the shifting of the barrier islands and what happens over geologic history with sea level going up and down and so on. So I was asked to to render my opinion. I saw the film, which is extensively about New Jersey, as, as was just explained, and I lived through Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy, and, uh, and I've had a history of dealing with the frontier of thinking in the museum field about uh, how to deal with what sometimes the museum field calls hot topics or controversial or contemporary issues. Um, it was, in fact, myself and the Dutch Ministry of Agriculture that brought to New York uh, a symposium in 2009 to mark the 400th anniversary of Henry Hudson arriving in the harbor to bring attention to the very things that happened in Hurricane Sandy. And I brought Islamic science rediscovered to the museum right opposite Ground Zero when we reopened the science center where I was. My point I'm making is that this institution has had, is having, and will continue to have uh, an extensive embrace of all things that relate to the intersection of nature and, and humans, 
After all, humans live in floodplains, they live in earthquake zones, they live on the flanks of volcanoes, they live on coasts which are subject to storms and to, and to sea level rise. We're dealing with all these issues through exhibitions and programs. And I'm also adding, if I may, Frank, that I've, I was brought to this position because of, of my uh, rich history in dealing with these very issues in the science in a field. So, it, so w with this history and the fact that the museum does have exhibits that clearly show global uh, climate change is for real, that uh, the rising, t rising ocean uh, levels are a serious problem, all that is here. What was it about this film that you thought was inappropriate for this particular museum? I mean, why not, why not screen this film? What was the decision? Uh, because a 60-minute film followed by a Q&A is, is firstly not, doesn't fit the mold of what we generally do on a science uh, cafe on a Thursday evening here, where uh, there is an interaction between our MC and the scientist over usually 20 minutes or half an hour, and the program is all done by an hour. Um, showing somebody else's view as opposed to interviewing somebody ourselves, which is what we do weekly, um, those are very different methodologies. And a, and a museum that, that, that is this sophisticated has, in fact, a very diversified toolkit for dealing appropriately with issues. And so I'm on record in the media this week in talking about us wanting to, to bring about a robust methodology to deal much more proactively with, with any of these issues that where science intersects with matters of societal innovation and environmental stewardship. Uh, th this is not to be interpreted as, as some sort of signal that the museum has not, is not, and will not deal with these issues, Frank. Terry Lomax, let me ask you, you have an interesting position at NC State, Vice Chancellor of the Office of Research, Innovation, and Economic Development uh, at NC State. So it sounds like all of those things come together, and when it comes to economic development and science, that's where we can really see politics and, and science mixing. Tell us a little bit about your role and how you sort of manage this question of, of how, to, how to do the research um, sort of in the face of politics. Well, I think the, to describe the role is we do everything from research development, so finding the opportunities for our faculty to go over that, that match their talents, to helping them go out and get the grants and manage them once they're there, all of that, but also how to translate that out, whether it be by publishing their results or by helping with a exhibit at a museum or if it's by starting a company or licensing the technology out, whatever it takes to get it out. Um, our role as a public university is to make sure that happens. And, in the best cases, that results in economic development. So that's the final part of the continuum that works out so great. And so the question always is kind of what's in the driver's seat because we understand that basic research sometimes doesn't have necessarily an end. I mean, uh, you, you talk about Lindsay was walking around in Utah and tripped over, you know, uh, bones. Now, like she she has an eye for this right. sort I of thing. Right, I think she's trained to do she's that. She's <laughs> very well trained and knows what she's looking at. Um, but but the idea that you're going to be looking for you don't know what and then find it is the, the stuff that basic research, but when you try to apply it, it can narrow the scope. I mean, and, do you and, run and into that kind of... Absolutely, because that's very much in our, our DNA, so to speak, at NC State, because we are a land-grant university with a public mission to apply what we're doing. So we are doing the fundamental research, but also applying it and making sure that it gets out so that the public can, can utilize it. So you're always having all different things pulling at you or pushing at you in different directions. And what we try to do is remain the source of the discovery, but also the source of balanced information about that we can put out and to reflect all aspects of different issues and cover as much of it as we can. But it gets tricky in a film, in a film uh, like the one we're talking about today, you have, I mean, the, the question is, should federal and state dollars be used to shore up our coastlines at, federal, at public expense or not? Now, the technology involved in that could be the stuff of NC State. How do we do it? Let's go to NC State, talk to researchers about ways that we can build up and keep people mm -hmm. there. And the thrust of this movie, and I have to say it had a, it had a direct uh, kind of policy point of view beyond the science. It took a point of view that this is a very bad idea. And you heard Scott call it insane. I mean, so it's, it is cited uh, in terms of the outcome. What do you do as a researcher when you're asked to, to, to research something with a very serious political edge? To shore up or not is a political question. That's the core of being a researcher is to 
to do it with the unpolitical point of view. You're just going in there, and it's just the facts, ma'am. I mean, you're going after what is the truth about whatever it is that you're working on. And it's also getting a variety of different researchers. So it's those civil engineers that are going to study how, if you wanted to protect it, you would do it. But it's also the ecologists and others that are going to tell you what are the impacts of what you're doing. And so these things can be in parallel. So let me go back to you, Scott Hewler. You heard what... Uh, Emily Coster said uh, about the reasons for rejecting the film. And in fact, I think there were a couple of scientists in this film who have also spoken Indeed. here, right? Do Dr. Pilkey from Duke and Dr. Riggs from Eastern Carolina State University are past speakers in our science cafe, and they're referenced in the film. And Dr. Pilkey is an outspoken opponent of, of coastal, development. coastal development. Right. So, but so, Scott, what about that, that argument that this is just not the appropriate venue? We're not censoring the film. We just don't think we should show it in this format. I'm, I have to say I'm still not clear why this isn't the appropriate venue. This is a, a statewide science museum. It has uh, conservation as one of its main missions. We have an enormous theater in the other building that you could show it. I, if Thursday night isn't the right time to do it for Science Cafe, do it Saturday afternoon. Do it, have a special showing Thursday night. You know what, make, uh, we have a two-hour Science Cafe for you so that we're going to have an hour-long uh, discussion afterwards. It seems to me that in these times, when there is so much political attack on science in this state, and I don't mean political dispute of opinion on science, I mean political attack on science in this state, I think that the museum saying, we're just not going to show this, somebody else can do that, is the museum missing an opportunity to defend its position and to help inform its job is to get the science out there, get the opinions out there, get the word out. This is an opportunity for the museum to help get get the word out by what's what sounds like a perfectly legitimate filmmaker. Uh, Scott, as you, you may have read in, in this week's coverage, uh, the uh, State Aquarium at Fort Fisher showed this film, but it's important to know that that was part of a film festival. And what I said in, in an earlier interview this week uh, on the record is that the toolkit of a natural sciences museum is not the same toolkit as uh, an aquarium, and we were not putting this film into a film festival. We will be doing film festivals, and we're partnering, as will be the nature of announcements uh, in a few months, incredibly with some of the top uh, producers of film festivals about nature. So there's an abundance of resources out there, and this was simply one offering that came from the Coastal Federation, whose mission I have been on record as greatly respecting. But we made the decision, and I didn't actually make a different decision differently than that of the program committee, who had viewed this film and felt that it wasn't the right thing at the right time to deal w in a nuanced way with such a complicated issue. What about, is there a place for a film like this, even one that takes a point of view in, in terms of policy, uh, and then back it up with a panel so that the public can be invited in for a discussion with people on both sides, having seen, in this case, a provocative film? But perhaps. Uh, I think I'd also want to emphasize that any discourse, uh, and, and I think that's what uh, NC State is doing, um, is the, the dis discourse has to be civil. And I have also said this week that um, one of the tools that is available to, to have these kinds of discussions constructively and in a civil way is to bring about a, a, pro a protocol called the triple bottom line, that there is no sustainable solution to any of these issues like coastal development and sea level change or, or violent weather unless we bring to the table at the same time to hear each other deeply and earnestly the people, planet, and profit sides of an issue. Science is, is, is at the core of that issue and has to drive the ultimate knowledge but it also has to find synergy, as, as is the case, for example, at the Oregon Inlet. I was just down visiting the Coastal Studies Institute of UNC last week and was profoundly moved by the example of an inlet that was created by a hurricane more than a century ago, for which now there's a delicate uh, community balance, and I met with all of the stakeholders, people, planet, and profit, to arrive at a sensible and rational decision which they seem to be moving towards in order to co-manage the movement of sand along the beach, the need for that inlet to remain open to shipping traffic and yachting traffic, and at the same time putting sound science and coastal engineering into it. I want to, well, I want to thank all of you. I'm out of time, but I want to thank all of you. Emlyn Coster is the director of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Scott Hewler, a Raleigh-based writer who blogs for Scientific American. Terry 
Lomax, Vice Chancellor of the Office of Research, Innovation, and Economic Development at NC State. Thank all of you for being on the program. Thank you very much, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Coming up, the Mint Julep Jazz Band. We'll hear about them and a wonderful fundraiser they're going to do, and we'll hear their music right now. Stay with us.